The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. You know, sometimes we meet on the terrain of suffering where we can't genuinely meet anywhere else. And uh, it's being the most vulnerable, it's being the most honest, it's leaving aside, you know, kind of titles or uh, job descriptions and saying, yeah, it's rough, you know, <laughs> things are really hard. I'm Maura Aarons Mealy, and this is The Anxious Achiever. We look at stories from business leaders who've dealt with anxiety, depression, or other mental health challenges, how they fell down, how they pick themselves up, and how they hope work will change in the future. The phrase, there's an app for that, has perhaps never been more true than when it comes to mindfulness, meditation, and even mental health in today's world. At a time when mental health, at least on the surface, has gone mainstream, with huge tech companies building brands around it, It's good to remember that mental health is still stigmatized in many organizations, forcing us to hide our suffering. And while an app is a good start, treating mental illness or even increasing mental wellness requires going deep, looking at your pain, acknowledging the hard stuff. This is where mindfulness and meditation can be so powerful. So today, we're going back to the basics the tool in the toolkit for all overworked, anxious achievers that is mindfulness. And we'll speak to one of the great masters, Sharon Salzberg. In the world of meditation, Sharon is a renowned teacher, a best-selling author. Her sayings live on mugs and calendars. Sharon still gets anxious from time to time. She even worries about letting people down. But Sharon inspires me and so many others because she doesn't shy away from talking about what is uncomfortable. And I started by asking her if she finds it interesting to see just how far mainstream work culture has changed. The idea that mindfulness and meditation is now so much more accepted in the corporate world. I, I, interesting is, is one word. I mean, it's (laughs) passive. It's surprising. It's amazing. It's kind of mind blowing, really. Really? I went to India um, when I was a college student on an independent study program uh, to study meditation. I got Mm. permission to create this project. This was, I went in 1970, and I began uh, my first meditation retreat in January of 1971. Wow. So as my friends say, before it was cool. Way before. I was doing it way before. And... uh, uh, I came back, finished school, went back to India. And when I left India in 1974, uh, it was with the instruction of one of my teachers, this woman named Deepama, to teach myself, which I also thought was ridiculous, you know. But mm. she said, when you go back to the States, you'll be teaching. And I thought, no, I won't. Um, but, no. of course, as, as life unfolded, she was correct. And, um, you know, in those days, I'd be at a party or some social situation and, people would say, what do you do? And I'd say, I teach meditation. And they'd kind of like go, oh, that's weird. (laughs) Sort of sidle away. Or occasionally somebody would ask me, did you meet the Beatles over there? (laughs) I'd say, no, sadly, they went when I was in high school. And there was different tradition altogether. But, you know, and then through the years, I've watched, of course, you know, with some amazement where, uh, you know, I think largely because of the science and the research and and really, the relanguaging, it's its a much greater understanding that meditation, mindfulness doesn't need to be tied to a belief system or mm-hmm. a faith tradition. It's about learning how to pay attention differently. And, you know, so then I'd be at that same kind of situation and I'd be introduced as a meditation teacher and people would say, I'm so stressed out. I could use some of that. Or occasionally I'd hear, my partner should really meet you. It'd be really good for them. And, <laughs> You know, and time has gone on, and I'd say back when we were, when I was still going to parties and and social situations, the most common comment I would hear was, oh, I tried that once, I failed at it. Yeah. And, of course, we don't believe you can fail at it at all, so that 
brings up the question is what do people expect and what's the understanding about what's going to happen. But we're definitely in a whole other era. We'll, t- we'll talk about the failure concept in a little bit. But one quote that, that I think, I can't remember if you wrote it, if you said it, but I have it as from, from when you went to India, you said, I felt not on the margins for the first time in my life. Yeah. What, did, what did that experience in learning meditation do for you? I think it actually began before I went to India. It was one of the reasons I went to begin with. I took an Asian philosophy course when I was a sophomore. And I, I'm a product, I should also say, of the New York City public school system, mm-hmm. which means I skipped two grades. So I went to college <laughs> when I was 16, went wow. to India when I was 18. Uh, there was a philosophy requirement, and I just looked at the schedule. And I saw an Asian philosophy course, and I thought, oh, that looks convenient. It's like on Tuesday or something. Let me do that one. And it was actually in the context of the course that that shift you're describing began, because when the instructor was talking about Buddhism, he talked, of course, about the Buddha's very famous kind of commentary on the suffering in life. And Uh, You know, that suffering is a natural and an inevitable part of life. And um, for many people, that's sort of a depressing message and and a real turnoff. But for me, it was maybe the first time in my life I felt like, oh, you're not so weird. Because I, like many people, had had a very traumatic, uh, painful childhood. And uh, I felt different. You know, my family didn't look like anybody else's family. I was living with my grandparents for a big chunk of it, for example. And uh, my mother had died when I was nine. My father was already gone, you know. And so, but there I was in that class. And, and somehow that message came to me that this is this is part of life, you know. Not that we all suffer in the same measure or the same degree, but it's inevitable. You're not so different. You're not left out. And and then I heard in the class that there were methods, there were techniques that people used called meditation to be a lot happier. So I was going to college in Buffalo, New York. I looked around Buffalo. I did not see it anywhere. And I thought, I'm going to create an independent study project and go to India, which was ridiculous. I'd never even been to California. You know, I was 18 years old. But did the message of suffering make you feel heard like what what was yeah. that about because you're right and I think the failure question is, a lot of people feel is they think I don't want to suffer I want to take a pill and feel better yeah yeah what what about you made that suffering concept attract you well I think partly because my family system like many was one where the the conflict the loss the pain was never spoken about you know and so my internal sense of what was real was one thing and the external confirmation of it was quite another and this was the first time it was sort of like confirmation writ large you know like this is a part of life it's not just you because of course the presentation is that everyone else's family's perfect you know and, right and no no one's suffering at all you know and you know it's, it's so hard to have compassion for yourself if if you feel that it's all only you, you know, and because then, of course, it brings up the concomitant thought, it must be my fault. Um, right. And so to have that that sense of, oh, this is a part of life, I am a part of life, was incredibly important. And I think, you know, sometimes we meet on the terrain of suffering where we can't genuinely meet anywhere else. And uh, mm. it's being the most vulnerable, it's being the most honest. It's leaving aside, you know, kind of titles or uh, job descriptions and saying, yeah, it's rough, you know. It's rough (laughs) out there. It's really hard. (laughs) I do want to talk about suffering and anxiety on this show because this is a show for people who have mental health struggles. I was watching a video that you did on, it was called Anxiety, Addiction, and Depression and Dealing with Them in the Way of the Buddha. And you said, I think you said something like, there's something reassuring about even saying the words addiction, anxiety, and depression, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because it's inclusive. We're gathering together and we may have these horrible things, but if we can be together and talk about it, it makes connections. Well, I mean, I think it's the most healing thing of all because, you know, there is the problem, whatever the problem is, and that's genuine suffering. And I think we shouldn't discount that. 
one of my favorite sayings, apparently, because friends have started sending me mugs and cups with things I often say on them, you know. So <laughs> one came through that said, uh, something's just hurt. Yeah. You know, something's just hurt. And I think we do ourselves a grave disservice by thinking, I should be better at this, you know, like, why is this such a drag? It's a drag because something's really hurt. And it's not our bad attitude. It's not our wrong way of thinking. It's not that we need to be more receptive. Something's just really hurt. And it's also true that we might add to that things that are what I call extra suffering, you know, which we don't need, like a sense of isolation. It's only me. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, a sense of uh, perpetuity. This is going to last the rest of my life. No, this is never going to change. A sense of blame. I shouldn't be able to stop this. Like I've been meditating for 50 years now. Why am I still feeling this or, or whatever it is? You know, and those things we really learn through mindfulness uh, as one method, you know, to catch as it's creeping into our mind stream and, and letting go of that because that we don't need. Do you still feel anxiety? Would you consider yourself an anxious person? I certainly I feel everything. I mean, I would never say I didn't feel something. I, yeah, I mean, it's sort of a funny mix of anxiety and um, withdrawal, you know. Mm. Like, I have friends who are massively anxious. Like, my friend Sylvia Borstein will describe herself as a recovering catastrophizer. <laughs> you know, she says she's 85 now, and, and she got interested in meditation because she was haunted by those thoughts. Now, she may have exactly the same thoughts, but she can laugh at them or she can at least hold them in, I don't know yet, perspective. Like she says, you know, she called one of her adult children, so her children are in their 60s. You know, I'll call one of my adult children. They don't answer the phone. Well, they must be dead. You know, she said, it never occurs to me that they're taking a shower, you know, or they fell in love. They don't feel like talking to their mother, hmm. you know, and that, used to haunt her but now it's so there's so much more space around it even if the same thought is arising that uh, she really can laugh at it and wait and see call back you know like (laughs) call back you know and interestingly enough she describes herself as somebody who in an actual emergency or problem she's like a rock she's totally steady yeah it's all the imagination in her mind that gets her going so uh I'm not an anxious person like that. I don't tend to catastrophize, but there's a certain feeling that I get um, where uh, things are out of control. Things are crazy. Someone's son just went to jail. Someone else's, you know, partner is having a mental health crisis. And there's something in me that Mm -hmm. says, oh, this is how things are supposed to feel. Mm Because this is how they felt my whole childhood, you know. And I think, oh, this is this is natural. This is right. And of course, it's not natural and right. It's a problem, you know. It's really pressure on somebody or it's hurtful for somebody. And and so I have to remind myself, no, this is this is not an ordinary day, you know. This this is really uh, a lot for someone to carry. How might you do that? Is there something you could just take us through? Because I think a lot of us might find that news just hits us in the middle of a, a work day. Yeah. Our breath is taken away. Yeah. And and I think, you know, uh, some of it is very somatic. It's really learning what it feels like in your body mm-hmm. when you're panicking or when you feel, I mean, another one is hyper responsibility, you know, mm-hmm. like I'm going to be the one to fix this, you know. <laughs> and even though you wouldn't necessarily associate that with a certain sensation, I think we can. If we just keep paying attention and for me, it's like a jumpiness. It's it's, yeah. it's it's like my whole body is awake and just needs to go run a million miles an hour. Right. Exactly. There's something, you know, yeah. and we can learn it. And and that becomes my signal. You know, I, there's a certain something I feel like this wave of energy coming up in my stomach and then something else settles like, oh, this is this is right. And that's my signal to say, well, it's not really right. You know, this is like this is a big problem for somebody. And. I can't fix it. Mm. You know, like I will do everything I can to be present, to care, whatever is called for. If I have some skill that 
is called for. And I can't imagine that I am in control because then we're sunk. You know, it's just not true. And uh, there's that certain feeling when I'm taking in someone's suffering mm -hmm. as though we're mine to address mm. rather than theirs with me in some kind of presence or solidarity. And I can feel the difference. How? Do you feel it in your body? I feel it in my body. And then that is my signal to say to myself, um, whatever. And usually humor is a good technique. Like, who put you in charge of the universe? <laughs> uh, I remember I once said in front of a group of people, I felt like if I were in charge of the universe, it would be a lot better a world. And, and someone in the class said, are you sure? <laughs> And so I thought for a moment, and I said, I am really sure. So sometimes I say to myself, are you sure? <laughs> the LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. In the last 100 years, we've seen financial markets swing. New currencies come and go. Decades of savings lost in days. All showing that a retirement plan without a guarantee, quite simply, isn't enough. So more than a retirement plan, TIAA makes you a retirement promise. A promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. A promise that pays off. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. It's funny because I, I have interviewed Jerry Colonna on the show, and mm -hmm. I know that, that he's studied with you as well. Mm -hmm. And he, he is a, a sort of recovering hypervigilant, I think he would say. And it sounds like what you're advocating for is for those of us who might want to jump into hypervigilance and take on everyone else's anxiety as well mm -hmm, as assume mm -hmm. actions is to take a breath. Yeah. 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 Well, it's the pause. That's the most important thing, however you do it, you know, yeah. because, and it's also, you know, like I work a lot with caregivers, whether it's um, in their families, you know, and uh, parents, children, or it's professionally. And, people who are really on the front lines of suffering and it's because they care. It's because of the tenderness in their hearts that they do want to take it on. And, and then they crash inevitably and people then blame themselves, you know, like I, uh, I'm too weak to do this or, you know, I don't have the strength or uh, I don't know why it got so out of control, you know, and, mm. and, Really, that's the extra layer, you know, of suffering because it, it's because of one's caring that we end up in that position. But we need to learn some boundaries. We need to learn some balance. We need to learn to care for ourselves as well as for others. Is there an exercise that you might offer them? One of the things I love about a lot of your work is that you have these sort of quick, quick meditations that you can do. Mm -hmm. I mean, what would you tell someone who's caring too much right now? but has to show up at work anyway. Sometimes it really is boundary setting, um, you know, and so it might be asking yourself, where is the, like, what can I not control, you know? Yeah. What can I actually affect and what can I not control? And, and sometimes I literally remind myself it's out of my hands and, mm. you know, I will do everything. And, and the idea of, um, like loving kindness or compassion for somebody is that it's like a gift mm -hmm. and we give it with the best intention and the wish that somebody use it and enjoy it. And, but you can't make them like put on that sweater, you know, and say, this is the best thing I've ever gotten. Or, you know, read that book you wrote and say, I can't believe, you know, the genius. It's like, we would like that, but it doesn't always happen. And so, I remind myself sometimes this is a freely given gift. Mm. I'm just, I'm making this offering. Um, and the hardest thing sometimes for people is to feel that some compassion for themselves is worthy, you know, that it's not selfish, it's not being lazy. And because we have such impossibly perfectionistic standards. I'm talking about the root of anxiety, you know. It's like, how could we ever be good enough, you know? Like, Do you find this with caregivers in particular? Oh, yeah, um, definitely. I mean, it is that tenderness that leads them to the role often. Um, and then 
partly because those roles, whether it's personal or professional, tend to be quite under-resourced yep. in society. Um, AKA paid less. Exactly. Paid less, honored less, <laughs> um, recognized less. There's a lot of less, you know, mm-hmm. that could be a long list. And um, then it's a struggle, you know, and you can't ask yourself for the impossible. But we do. <laughs> You know, and then if you do make a mistake, back to failure, you know, or you snap, you know, you get exhausted, you get overwhelmed, you get reactive, then, you know, you feel so terrible. But I think a lot of one's practice, you know, in life is sort of picking yourself up and starting over, but not sort of dwelling incessantly. Mm -hmm. But that's what perfectionists are great at, too. Oh, totally. 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 Like if you were the kind of person who were, um, if you were in the habit of evaluating yourself, like at the end of the day, like how'd I do today? (laughs) Let's just say you're the kind of person who only remembers the mistakes you made and what you didn't say so clearly and what, what you could have been better at. Let's just say, you know, sometimes you ask yourself, anything else happened today? You know, (laughs) Right. Could you actually ask yourself that? Oh, yeah. One of the things we talk about a lot as a kind of healing modality is a gratitude reflection, like write down at the end of the day, three things that you're grateful for from the day. And they don't have to be magnificent or grandiose. And some people really don't like that. They think it's like sentimental and it's something that um, makes you you know, happy to get crumbs and you never confront the an unfair system or something like that. But actually research shows that it's, it's like a power, you know, because if you're exhausted, if you feel depleted, if you feel you have nothing going in your life, you have nothing to give, you're not going to be that useful, you know? So the things that are kind of restorative for us and pick up our energy and give us a little buoyancy and, and, um, those are, are important in our continued connection to others. So it's not really selfish. And it's shown that gratitude is a, is a formidable force in that way um, because it, it it's kind of rounds out the picture. You know, it's not to say there are no problems or no real sources of suffering at all, but we need to kind of be nourished. We need to have some resilience. And so how do we meet meet the moment, you know, and, so I always say it can be a small thing, you know, but write it down. And I also say, as is true, that that's not my natural conditioning. You know, my personal conditioning, my family's conditioning, my cultural conditioning is such that I'm so much more likely to come to the end of the day and think about what I can complain about. Mm-hmm. And it's always like I didn't show up in the right way. I didn't say the right thing. I'm, You know, or that person wasn't really there for me or back in the day when I was traveling incessantly, there was always an airline and, you know, (laughs) there's always a phone service or, you know, one's computer program or something. And that's just where my attention goes. And so it is a very conscious decision, not through force or coercion, but through intentionality to say, okay, what else? What else happened today? Right. So you're not telling people that they have to become all gratitude and no grumble. Like you could still ease yourself out of the grumble. Yeah. Or at least least the word is balance, you know? (laughs) (laughs) What? Yeah. I mean, grumble, which is a great term, um, (laughs) you know, it's inevitable, really. And it would be unreal to imagine, you know, such sweetness. (laughs) I was reading about you in your business travel life, I guess, back in the former times. And, yeah. and it's funny, it must be weird for a lot of people who read you and know you as the great teacher to think of you sort of suffering on Southwest Airlines with the rest of us. <laughs> poor schleps. But, but you were saying that, that like, it can be hard for you. you the plane is late, you're going to miss your connection, you might mm-hmm. not make it to that. And that that makes you really anxious, just like it makes the rest of yeah. us. Yeah. Has this changed for you during the pandemic? Or has the, that kind of anxiety found another place to go? Um, well, I'm not traveling at all. I haven't been on yeah. an airplane since March 2nd, I think, 2020. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, to the degree that I project 
into the future because that was the problem sitting on the airplane you know uh i'm gonna be late what's gonna happen i'm gonna miss the lecture you know i shouldn't have and also a tremendous amount of self-blame because that is my Mm -hmm. habit you know like i was so stupid why did i make this reservation i should have known better you know you know so there's always there's always another channel for (laughs) self-blame pandemic (laughs) or not you know like why did i do that no i think my big resolve in the pandemic has been um, to try to be kinder, and that has included toward myself. So just things like, because it's space. So I take the time, like if I write an email, not to just press send right away, and to take a few breaths and then read it again, and then think, do I actually want to send it in this form? And often, you know, it's such a strange form of communication. You can sound so terse and you didn't mean it, and and so I rewrite it in some way, and then I then I press send, and just sort of taking the time in those ways is has really been a, a delight. Sharon, you've said I think of anxiety and depression as a manifestation of a deep yearning we have as humans to be happy, free, mm-hmm. have a sense of belonging. The yearning is the point. Don't feel squeamish or embarrassed. There's a wish to be happy underneath. Really? Well, I mean, I think that's our basic human dilemma that uh, every one of us wants to be happy, not in a superficial way, like a pleasing day only, you know, but a really deep sense of feeling at home somewhere in this body, in this mind, with one another, with this planet, on this planet. And Mm -hmm. the problem many, you know, spiritual systems would say is not that yearning, it's not the desire, it's that we have bad aim. You know, (laughs) either we have been taught myths and lies, if you only accumulate enough, you know, endlessly, you'll be happy, you'll be safe. It's like all totems against change and death, you know, like, let's get another one, you know, let's get another car or painting or house or, you know, orange or whatever it is. Um, you know, and, and depending on other uh, habits, other reinforcements, we uh, can sort of dive off the deep end of that. Or we've been taught we don't really count. We don't matter. We're not capable. Of, this is not the same as saying we're perfect, but we are capable of change and growth and understanding every single one of us. And, and not all of us were brought up that way, you know, with that that reinforcement and so we have that yearning and and it's so um distorted because we really don't feel we're worthy of happiness and there's so many so much conditioning around that and then i honestly think these days you know um so many people have gone through some kind of trauma which is sometimes um sharp and clear you know terrible incident accident uh horrible thing happened sometimes it's slower and chronic like I've had people tell me that the most traumatic force in their lives was like growing up in poverty Mm -hmm. you know and I, I just think a lot about the residue on one's nervous system and I think it's not a it's not a question of personal fault and that uh there are ways of healing that there are ways of coming to a, a greater state of balance And that will give us a lot of inner strength. You recommend two steps when you feel anxious. One, distinguishing between anxiety and fear. Mm -hmm. And two, applying an antidote. Mm -hmm. Talk us through that. Well, there, uh, given what we were just talking about, there are certain ways of breathing, for example, where um, researchers say that, uh, I mean, the main thing is that your out breath needs to be longer than your in breath. Why distinguish between anxiety and fear, though, first? Well, I I mean, I think um, it depends, you know, like (laughs) some people do and some people don't. Like, yeah, within the Buddhist uh, psychology, you know, which is something that I trained in, there are uh, different energy imbalances that are talked about. Mm-hmm. And and they're that they're energy imbalances, and so if we have too much energy in our system for the amount of calm or concentration, we will get anxious. Mm. 
if we have too much calm for the amount of energy, we'll get kind of slothful you know, <laughs> and disengaged. So anxiety is not seen as like a flaw or, a, you know, got to clean up your act kind of thing or why are you so upset? You need to, you know, it's like an energy imbalance. Wow. And so the remedy, you know, the antidote in that way would be trying to change the balance. You know, it's not talking yourself out of it and it's not trying to talk yourself down. It's changing the actual balance so that the energy kind of calms down or gets channeled and is not so kind of free floating and so that the, the calm deepens. And so the fear, I think, would be much more specific. Anxiety is is like that imbalance and and the fear um it's taking cognitive form, like, um, right. I'm not going to be able to pay my rent next year. Right. Right. Got it. You know, something like that. And, and that, I mean, fear isn't all bad either. That might point to things in life that really need to shift, but it also can, I mean, the thing I say about fear, for example, that I've learned is that, um, we can get very personal insights into the roots of fear. Uh, for ourselves. So what I've seen sitting in meditation, just looking at fear, and that means looking at it in my body, what does it feel like? Kind of watching the fear movie play out. Hmm. Uh, no, you know, commentary, no judgment, just like what's happening? Well, how does this work in me? What I've seen is that despite the world's pronouncement, which is also true, that uh, we're afraid of the unknown. I'm actually not that afraid of the unknown. <laughs> I'm afraid when I think I do know and it's going to be really bad. Mm. And so that's the place where I do tell stories to myself. That's the catastrophizing, you know, like I'm going back to my apartment in New York City where I've been paying rent, by the way, all this time. Okay. And, you know, I haven't been there in, in uh, eight months. And I heard that if you turn on the the water, you know, in the sink after eight months or 10 months or a year, that you can get Legionnaire's disease. What are the symptoms of Legionnaire's disease? How will I know? You know, like, and then right. if I remind myself, you know what? You don't know. Hmm. This is just imagination. Then I relax and I feel space. I think, hey, I don't know. So for me, those stories are, are more the root of the fear than anything. My last question for you is a is a is a favor for our listeners who get anxious because they are anxious. Mm -hmm. Right? So many of us live with anxiety and especially during the work day, I think, because this is a show about work. Mm -hmm. we, we get so scared that something is going to make us panic and take us off track mm -hmm. that we just get frozen, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if you could author a um a short meditation or breath piece or just something that they could use. Sure. Um, like what I was what I was saying before was that there are certain often in meditation with the breath, we just use the normal natural breath. And that's fine because that will be grounding and help. But um, there are certain breath tools that are described by researchers as moving the emphasis away from the sympathetic nervous system to the parasympathetic nervous system. So your panic will start to ease, your blood pressure will go down, things like that. And so that is the major rule of that. There are many fancy ways of doing it, but the major thing is that your out breath needs to be longer than your in breath. And your whole system will start to change. So um, we can do a few moments, if you like, um, of a practice, because it, it can be inclusive of other things. The whole idea is, uh, we've got this energy, it's kind of running wild. We want to balance it out, you know, with with greater centeredness or 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 more groundedness. And then we have the benefit of the energy actually, uh, without it it being so intense. So uh you can sit comfortably, you can close your eyes or not, you don't have to. And we'll take a few uh just normal breaths without trying to change it or or manipulate it in any way. See where you feel the breath most distinctly, the nostrils, the chest, or the abdomen. And then for a few moments. See if you can breathe in that way that I described, where the out breath is longer than the in breath. You can 
do it, you know, people's breath length is different, but maybe breathe in to the count of three, breathe out to the count of five or something like that, whatever works for you. Feel what's happening in your body. Feel what's happening to kind of that energy that you may have been feeling. And even with your eyes closed, if they are, notice what you're seeing. You may see with eyes closed, different patterns of light or different shadings. If your eyes are open, of course, you see whatever is in front of you. Notice what you see. Notice what you hear. Like I'm noticing the sound of the rain right now. Feel your body posture, like sitting. Feel your hands touching, or maybe your hands touching your knee, someplace where there's already contact. And then you can start again. Normal breath. And then the kind of conscious breath or the out breath longer than the in breath. And then a little tour of, of our sensory impressions. Okay, thank you. <sighs> Sharon, Sharon Salzberg, I just want to thank you very much and wish you a wonderful 2022. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for doing this. That's it for today's show. Throughout the season, I want to hear from you. On an upcoming episode, we're going to look at what it's like to negotiate when you have anxiety. I'd love to hear your stories of negotiations or give me your questions about mental health and negotiation with a voice memo or a video and send it to anxiousachievermail at gmail.com. That's anxiousachievermail, all one word, at gmail.com. We'd love to feature stories on the show. Our show is produced and edited by Mary Dew. Our assistant producer and sound engineer is Nick Krinko. Many thanks to the LinkedIn Presents family and to all our guests for sharing their stories if you love the show, tell your friends, follow us, and leave a review. You can also tweet me at Mora AM or find me on LinkedIn where you can follow, message, and subscribe to my LinkedIn newsletter for more from the Anxious Achiever world. If you message me on LinkedIn, I'll always get back to you. Thanks for listening.